and welcome to this very special event to celebrate 45 years of 2080's author panel. Today, we're investigating the world of audio drama, comics that have been turned into sounds. We've assembled members of the many teams who have turned some of the galaxy's greatest stories into audio adaptations. My name is Desiree Birch, and I was in 2020's Future Shocks Radio, which took some of 2080's best short stories and made them into delights for your ears. I mean, one can only help. Uh, joining me today are Paul Powell, who wrote the Judge Dredd adaptations that aired on BBC Radio One in the 1990s. Chris Thompson, who was the lead producer on Penguin Random House's award-winning audiobook adaptations of some of 2080's most famous stories. And Nat Tapley, who wrote and produced Future Shocks Radio, audio dramatizations of the comics Future Shocks short stories that were given away free to subscribers in 2020. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Hi. Really good to be Hi. here. Excellent. It's me. really lovely to have you here. And um, as someone who is very new to uh, the uh, 2080 world, I'm really excited to get a chance to interview you about your expertise and the different directions you've taken this um, incredible uh, world, like universe, you know, uh, the more I come to understand of it, the more mm -hmm. I realize how many great writers have come out of this world, how many different contributors have put things into it and how kind of like punk rock it is, even for a comic, which is like kind of like, you know, very, very high bar to set. It is very um, uh, political and forward thinking and fun and short form and just uh, uh, so many wonderful things have gone into it. And it's kind of like how comic writing should be. I'm curious to know from each of you when you first became aware of 2000 AD and also like how like what what appealed to you what was the first thing that drew you into the world can i, can I, I, I yes please straight away because i got issue one I, uh, right at the beginning. Uh, so, okay um, so you should definitely begin yes please yeah and so i i think it came with a free gift or two and i remember destroying those within minutes of getting the magazine but yeah so i um i came quite early just because it was such an exciting buzz around it you know there was this new comic on the scene and until then, every comic was kind of war. You know, it was Victor, Warlord, Battle. It was full of that. Boys' comics were all about the Second World War. And suddenly we had one which was about science fiction. Um, and I was a huge fan of Doctor Who and Hitchhikers and all these things. So, uh, in fact, Hitchhikers came later, I think. But, um, but 2000 AD was just joyous when that came onto the scene. So uh, did you hear about it from the sort of science fiction friends and people you were aware of as that? How you, you know, if, if it's another comic, what was the buzz coming from? Oh, I think it was coming from school, but also from adverts within other comics, you know, within, okay. The, same, okay. within the same line. So, yeah, I remember I remember rushing out to get that first copy. I'm sadly long gone. I that's the, the nature of it, isn't it? Do you remember, is there a story that sticks out to you from that very first one? Oh, God, no. But I was in I was in Northern Ireland visiting family, if I remember correctly. So that's that's I remember the time and place. But sadly, the contents, yeah. I think I was probably overwhelmed by transfers or flying plastic or whatever it was that came with this you one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, what about you? How did you get into 2000 AD? What uh, what hooked you? Well, I'm I'm a relative newcomer in the sense that uh, the 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 comics were sort of brought to my attention by Richard Lennon. I'd say probably about two years ago at Penguin, who said these could really work really well in audio, and so I'm sort of in this really lucky position. I suspect a lot of people who've been you know in the boat for a lot longer must know quite how much there is for me to discover really um but no i mean that i guess the main angle was you know that these stories are really relevant and 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 have stood the test of time a lot of them and you know the, the story that i i still remember about doing the dreads adaptation the recent ones was that the capital was being stormed around the time i was doing the sound design for dread america and you just thought well yeah, I mean, if, if if ever there was a yeah. time for these to be done, this is, you know, perfect. So, no, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I've read the Slane, well, a lot of Slane. I've read 
Halo, which we uh, Halo Jones, which we did uh, the three sort of big books of, um, and uh, and I'm sort of discovering all sorts of other ones right now, which I'm not allowed to talk about, obviously. But uh, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, the, I, I'm I'm really sort of on this sort of odyssey, discovering you know worlds that that, that yeah, I mean absolutely incredible and uh, and and a hundred percent relevant, I'd say. Is there any particular story that you aren't actually adapting that you still kind of like have warm cockles in your heart for that like speaks to you in particular? There was something about the imagery of uh, the uh, apocalypse war. I would love to have a bash at. Um, uh, yeah, that, that sort of really appealed to me. Again, I'm sort of looking at it very much from a sort of starting point. Um, but yeah, there's the, that one particularly just seemed like it, it would be worth a, a go in audio for sure. Can you, I mean, I am not f- familiar with Apocalypse War. Is it is it just the visual on the page that appeals to you or, or is it something about the story that feels... No, yeah, it's, it's just Apocalypse War, by the way, Chris. <laughs> the one I made in 1995. <laughs> wow. It's exactly that, yes. Yeah. Well, you could tell us what Amazing. was your experience of that then. No, I'm you, you go around. ahead, Chris. You go ahead. I'll come back. Well, to I mean, well, I, yeah, I, we'll come back around to that, <laughs> but I would love to hear, yes. I think it's mainly just the visual. There's something about it. Again, I'm literally completely new to it, but I looked at it and I thought that looks particularly like it would work well. But I, I, I mean, as I say, Paul it would be the expert on that, having done it already. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do, uh, is there something uh, that would work that you believe Paul would work really well in adapting something like that? Oh man, I mean, it'd be very now, wouldn't it? Apocalypse War. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And funny enough, actually, I mean, we'll come back to it, but certainly. <laughs> Going back to these shows, suddenly you go, my God, they were so prescient. Uh, yeah. So the details, which seem relevant now. And bear in mind that, you know, these were written in, uh, I think, about 1978, 79. And we re-recorded them in 95. And yet here we are, 22, and they are absolutely on the nose. So extraordinary. Mm. I mean, there's a future shock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm coming to you, Nat, in just a moment, Sorry. but I'm very <laughs> curious about this because I, this may feel like a softball question. Maybe it is, but I'm very curious to know why it is that really excellent science fiction is never out of date or just always on time. Whenever I've come across really good science fiction, it's just like, how did they know? we'd be this far down the dumps, you know, like, how did they know? Like everything that is, you know, dystopian future is, is like a lot closer. And I don't know if it's just following a pattern of human nature to its natural, natural, you know, I mean, obviously you, you have things other than the Jetsons that like never came true. And then you have other things that are like almost to the letter coming true. And, you know, what is the difference there in terms of the, the sort of staying power of really good, sci-fi do you think and i mean that's open to anybody is it the fact that being pessimistic about the human condition is always going to last better than being optimistic being about optimistic. the human <laughs> people who have I a poor view of humanity it. tend to write stories that last better than people yeah. who don't is there a maybe. lot of optimistic science fiction i guess it's just the flying cars bit that's the only <laughs> yeah. optimistic thing i could think about if <laughs> everything else is like yeah you're all going to die that's the thing about Star Trek, actually. I think it gave a really mm. optimistic view of the future, you know, yeah. that everyone coming together, all colours, all creeds, all cultures. So, uh, yeah, there is one. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, and, and a, a very long-lasting one. I guess it's yeah. there, sort of the star at the top of the Christmas tree for us to sort of hope for that, like, somehow we'll get over our own differences and divisions and be totally open to alien species all of a sudden because, <laughs> you know, we treat every human equally. So like, why not this Klingon that makes that, that tracks. Um, <laughs> Matt, uh, what about you? What was your entree into uh, 2000 AD and, you know, obviously then making future shocks radio. I mean, I think I probably sit between um, Paul and Chris in that I was certainly aware of 2000 AD as a child, but on the occasions I was bought it because they used to split the stories up into, you'd get a chapter or a few pages of one story, then you have to buy it the next week to get the next mm. bit. And because uh, my parents never regularly gave me pocket money and we couldn't get, <laughs> I used to occasionally get it and find most of the stories utterly baffling. So I'd be getting four stories in the middle of something that had been happening for weeks and weeks and weeks. But the bits I... <laughs> The bits that did work for me were the future shocks, which were sort of small standalone stories that I could a- yeah. understand the whole thing of. So that's what they've always had a special place in my heart. And that's why when I talked to Benny about doing something, they were 
for me, they seemed like a lovely way of doing something that could bring new listeners in without having to know a huge law or a huge backstory, a huge, you know, that having to know 45 now years worth of, of what's happened. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely was um, uh, pleasantly surprised in recording a couple of how, you know, the, the, um, there is something about doing something short form that either requires sort of distillation of something that, you know, to its essence or like deconstruction of something so that you can really see the essence of something. And I think mm. that both of those uh, approaches can really kind of cut through a lot. And I think just at the time that you were doing it, like we were really hungry for things yeah. to kind of cut through the like BS and the sort of, you know, like the veneer had gone from everything. Yeah. So stuff that was just kind of like hitting yeah. you like that was a lot more gratifying uh, yes we were, so to clarify we were doing it in the first lockdown so i think we were all quite starved of uh things to things that we could do but we could actually make audio dramas from within remotely yeah. using yeah. people's home studios and things and yes again the idea of the appeal of the short form was we could think of we go to all sorts of places. We had one that was set in uh, Hitler's castle. We had one that was in an underground bunker in the far future. We had uh, one that was set on the sun and we could go to all those <laughs> places while we were all trapped in our houses. Yes. Yes. It's nice to go to the surface of the sun when you're <laughs> yeah. trapped inside of your flat, looking at the same walls for weeks and weeks. I, I, okay. So uh, we sort of talked about this earlier, but uh, sort of, potentially contrary to what people might believe about a comic adaptation, why should it, why does it work well in an audio form? I, I think the key thing is just the imagination of the writing. I mean, it's so brilliant to work with these ideas. Um, and actually they lend themselves, I think, towards scale and, and being epic. So I think, you know, certainly in our adaptations, we tried to make them sound like the soundtrack to a movie you know, that didn't exist, just to try and give that sense of, you know, millions of people, the idea yeah. of huge tower blocks, all these things. So I, th I think the one thing that's great about audio is, yes, there's no limits. I mean, we, we all know those things about, you know, the famous line about the ships collide, um, that you can achieve things in audio that you just couldn't possibly do, even with CG, you still mm. can't do. But with radio, there is absolutely no limit. You just need someone to say, oh, my God, look at the ships collide. <laughs> uh, but you know, so be way. because the imagination does so much more than any sort of uh, individual graphic can do, you feel like that's what really, okay. But, but that's right. not to put down the artists, of course. I mean, of course. Again, it's the inspiration comes from those great drawings, those great artworks. So mm. I do think that that's also full respect as well. It is the combination of the of the writing and the drawing. Yeah, I think there's, there's, maybe... there's a lot of deep. Sorry, go. On. Sorry, Chris. No, you go ahead. No, I was going to say there's a lot of detail in 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 comic illustrations. That it, the, the one thing I found is that we when we were taking the text out of the comics to make a script out of it. When we sort of put it all back together with the effects in, if a scene wasn't working, I would always go back to the original illustration. Mm. I'd realised there was one little detail that was in the background the yeah. and you add it and suddenly every, the, the, the balance is back and everything works again. In, in that way, I suppose it lends itself very well as well because there is so much detail and thought that goes into it. Mm. We just need to bounce off that and, and, and recreate it in audio. Mm. Yeah, that's really beautiful to think about that image being, you know, obviously our imaginations do quite a bit, but that mm. image teaches us to kind of go further because yes, that is a beautiful thing about any kind of comic book is that when you look in there, you're like, oh, well, I didn't see that tiny little thing. And it makes you expand your vision of the world as well. Yeah. Um, Nat, what were you going to say? I, I think there's um, a slight, perhaps a slightly different experience for people listening to something who have read the comic from those who haven't, in that those who have read it will have those images um, f fresh with them in their minds. And uh, I certainly hope what we did would sort of add colour to what was already there for them. But for those who haven't read it, we managed to hire, you know, some of the greatest visual effects artists in the world who are themselves, their own imaginations to fill in the blanks. Um, and hopefully when they find the, when they come to the comics, find the comics, they'll find that those two things marry as well, because ideally they should. I, for me, you said we were trying to make sure that what we were doing with the sound was in some way was doing homage to the work, to the graphical work that was there. Yeah. Well, I mean, that kind of leads me to another question, which is what 
what do you all feel are the components of a comic that make for good audio? And are there components of a comic that make for bad audio in your experience of <laughs> ad, uh, you know, adapting them? What kind of lends itself and what are you working against? Um, well, for us, the stories we have, the short stories, uh, are quite often have a twist ending, which, um, so we very quickly found there are lots of those you can't do in audio very effectively. If the twist ending is, oh, they were very small all along, or, oh, they were very big all along, or they're... <laughs> then that's very difficult to do. So uh, what we found made a good story was one, having some characters that we could talk about because some of them were very conceptual, very ideas based, the original Future Shocks. Um, so having a character we could latch onto, having an interesting soundscape and having a plot that was narratively clear um, and wasn't dependent on a graphical reveal. That's what, that's what we were yeah. looking for. Okay. Did you know this before you started or did you have to find out the hard way when you were like, this one is not. <laughs> I hadn't hard. realized how many of the early ones were just, oh, these people were really tiny were all small. along. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Shyamalan yeah. ending of like, oh, they were just really small. Yeah. <laughs> Those okay. dinosaurs they were escaping from were us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, uh, what about for you, Chris? Uh, what have you found works and maybe doesn't as well? I think because we were given the brief that they had to be in the audiobook world, one thing yes. that really helped were the stories that had a narrative voice. So the to me, the most successful scenes of the Halo Jones was where she's writing a diary and she holds the whole story together. And, you know, listening to a lot of dramas, that are put out nowadays that's something that really helps if you've got a strong narrative voice with a strong character quite often uh what we're battling certainly with the dreads is that like the the, the narrative voice is so short it's just like mm. the odd you know not even a sentence there's three or four words saying and in another place and actually a lot of the time it's trying to think okay how do we make this work maybe it needs adaptation maybe it needs a little bit more to help it along because you can yeah. you know you can paint these incredibly detailed beautiful pictures in audio but at some point someone has to hold the story together um, and yeah. I've, I've always found that helps yeah, we need someone to hold our hand as we kind of go down into the depths with them. So yeah, that strong voice. Um, pa Paul, what would you have to add to that? I, I think for me, it was all about the characters. Um, I, again, the stories we chose had very big, strong characters, not least in the day the Lord died, we had Judge Caligula, who was just so <laughs> over the top, camp, dark piece of humour. He was a joy. So, and, and then in Dread, of course, you've got that classic kind of Clint Eastwood dead kind of deadpan style, but such a strong personality. I, I mean, I loved writing for Dread. It was just joy. I mean, it's, um, but yeah, the, the great thing we had, I think we, we grounded it in characters and of course, great action as well. That was very crucial to the whole thing. Um, I mean, actually the stories we chose are relentlessly driven by a story, uh, yeah. but have really satisfying plot lines. So I think we felt quite confident in our choice of two stories going in that we had, we had great material that would work well in audio. But, but also, of course, we had enormous choice. You know, yeah, where okay. we went. yeah, of course. You know, Dred's been running now since, I'm going to say, 78. I'm looking to the experts here. Can I ask a quick question, But When yeah. you're talking about action, how did you find um, doing, say, a car chase or a, a motorbike chase through a city? How did you make the beats of that clear yeah, in uh, audio? Well, this is, of course, I have to give credit to the great Dirk Mags now. I can't discuss this without talking about Dirk Mags, who is, of course, the lord and master of all audio adaptations. Um, so Dirk really has a great handle on that. Having done adaptations of Spider-Man, Batman and Superman, you know, he had great form here. So um, a lot of those, you know, logistical issues he dealt with. So occasionally we just have to have a little bit of dialogue, just explain perhaps where they are or how they're moving. But actually just the sound effects really drove the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I guess that leads me to the next question, which is sort of, uh, and you've all sort of touched on this, but what are some of the changes that you have had to make to certain stories in order to adapt them to an audio format? And also, you know, how, 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 how'd you feel about it? <laughs> you know, obviously you've got a job to do mm -hmm. and you're touching material that is someone else's. Like, how do you go into a thing going like, I want to do this just justice, which means changing it, you know, and how do you make those choices? Oh, it's a well, really I'm... difficult one to answer. Uh, Paul, do you want to go first? Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, 
I, I, I've been going back actually looking at some of the comments on it and it's refreshed my memory. I mean, again, I just want to stress this was 27 years ago. I did the, <laughs> it's 1995 um, when I was very fresh faced. But um, at that point, you know, we wanted to do something that was true and accurate and respectful to the original, but also because we knew that we'd get our heads bitten off if we did anything that tampered with the law, you know, and quite rightly. So we were very careful that when we, at, filled out or put in detail that we tried to do it without actually treading on the story too much. So we tried to be very truthful to the original, very respectful, but there did have to be changes. So sometimes it'd be adding in some dialogue. Uh, but the biggest change we made was at the end of the Apocalypse War, which of course originally ends with the whole of um, the soft block being blown up. Um, Dirk just said, it's just too dark. We can't do this at tea time on Radio 1 in the Mark Goodyear. <laughs> <laughs> we can't blow up an entire Soviet mega city, so we toned down the destruction of the uh, of the apocalypse war. So it wasn't quite the apocalypse, but it was still pretty damn bad. Yeah. But yeah, it felt totally that that was just too much, too dark. So um, we did actually make a big editorial change there. I think he was absolutely right to make that. That was Dirk's call. It was a tea time apocalypse, but <laughs> it was apocalyptic <laughs> for the audience there are not that enough experienced tea cakes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Chris, what about you? Well, um, I think for us, again, it's interesting to hear Paul talk about it because, the, the, you know, the, the the challenge is always being faithful. Uh, and and uh, it's, it sort of feels like it's a battle that you can't really win um, one way or another. Uh, because actually, for me, part of the pleasure of reading comics is that you sort of feel your way into this world because it's always particularly with sci-fi it's presented as this is the way things are and you sort of have to piece it all together so perfect example with halo jones it, it is confusing it's designed to be confusing when you first start off um and uh, so there's one of the, that was probably the biggest change that we made was that we there's this bit later on at the beginning of, of book two that it exposes the the story of of, of the whole universe okay. and we moved that to the very beginning of book one um and i've heard podcasts since uh, accusing us of uh, being uh, cowardice <laughs> uh, oh, yeah <laughs> which i thought you know obviously i mean i, I and i and i get it i do get the complaint but at the same time with something i guess my my thinking for that is that with visual comics you have elements uh, that are explained and you, you you can see you can absorb that a lot quicker with audio it's you you need a little bit more of a helping hand and so yeah. that was yeah probably the biggest change we made certainly and we did but having said that for the all the others we really did try and stick as much as possible to the source material yeah i mean i can imagine that i mean obviously that would have to come from people who are deeply seeped into the world who know what to compare it against but obviously for a new audience like you really do have to find a way to welcome them in otherwise why are they going to stay and listen and it exactly. can if they have to wait that long for the payoff with no visual and also sort of like not being able to get a foothold in this world you might lose them on the journey so exactly. that makes a lot of sense yeah. Um, uh, Nat, uh, what about you? Uh, in um, we, we had, a, we had a, a, a quite interesting, because some of our stories were quite thin and I was working with a sort of team of writers who we were giving it to, there was space for them to do some additive work. In fact, sometimes they'd need to, to build out the world a little bit from the very, okay. uh, some of the concepts are really quite tight and just a page or two long. Um, so there was space for people to work in there, although we were always very careful to make sure that that was that the central um, thrust and the characters were never tampered with. It was really sort of, can we build out this world? What fun can we yeah. have here? But with some yeah. of the older ones, um, we were much more, or certainly the ones I adapted myself, we were much more um, to the letter and we tried to keep all the uh, box, the panel, anything that was written in a panel, I sort of treated it as that has to be heard almost. But there was one incident where we couldn't, uh, well, I, one of the changes I made was uh, there was a story called Beware of Grok's Bearing Gifts, which was written 35 probably years ago. Um, and it was a sort of satire of uh, American culture or Australian culture um, becoming, mm. taking over British culture. And it had a, a Mrs. Thatcher in it. Uh, so we kept, although she was never named, it was just the Prime Minister. So we kept the same, prime. I got Steve Nallen, who did uh, Mrs. Thatcher for Spitting Image to do our nice. Prime Minister voice. Uh, but one of the lines that was used in that box has since been sort of co-opted by the far right as a sort of anti-immigration argument, which wasn't what Alan Moore was trying to do at all. No. It had just gained new, the overtones that 
wording had gained in the last 30 years weren't helpful. So I took, I took it out. And it's, obviously you don't feel great about messing with, you know, the work of Alan Moore and taking stuff out. But <laughs> it was for me that what was truer to the story was telling the story well, rather than having something that clunked and sounded and took you out of the story and made you yeah. think of a whole bunch of things that weren't there. So um, yes, we reluctantly rewrote uh, occasionally, but only when we had to, but it, there were op- uh, opportunities to add things and to get new yeah. writers to bring in some new ideas, which was quite fun. Yeah. Okay. So um, you did quite a lot of adaptive work, but that's just simply to flesh out uh, the sort of intent of what was there in each yeah. of these stories. Um, I uh, Perhaps you've sort of touched on this. I mean, you've talked about what makes a story good to be adapted, but that necessarily isn't the reason why you choose a story. Like, why did you each mm-hmm. choose the stories that you chose to adapt? You know, some of it is going to be about, oh, well, this will what would work well, but also some of it has got to be about what it's done to you internally. So, you know, why did you choose the stories that you chose? Um, uh, I, I'm happy to start with Paul since I know that you have a, you know, a world in which you chose like one singular thing so, to really talk about. I mean, just to give you a bit of background on how it all came around. The, originally, it was an idea from a producer called Phil Clark, who now is okay. doing great things as a TV producer and a, a, as a manager. But um, originally, we were adapting just single strips from Dread, the standalone stories. So um, the whole idea began as just one-offs, effectively, you know, in the same way as a future shock, it'd be a standalone yeah. story. Um, but then there was this idea that, look, let's move this into the realm that Dirk's in. And in fact, Dirk took over as the producer and took the project on. So um, it went from being, you know, one piece to being then suddenly we're looking at 80 episodes of three minutes. So um, we looked at taking two stories uh, but of course, the thing about Dread, it developed such a continuity and such a canon that we realised we really had to start quite early because otherwise we're just going to confuse people, especially in three minute bursts. So we did this idea of going to the very beginning. So we looked at things like the Cursed Earth story, uh, the Judge Child, I think we looked at as well. But eventually the two that stood out would be we're doing the, the Day of the Lord Died, Judge Caligula and doing Apocalypse War, we're incorporating Block Mania as well as the kind of the prequel. Um, because th- you wouldn't really need to know much about Dread to come and listen to those stories. I think the, okay. the idea was, these are the, the police, they're in a huge city, you know, they, they are the law, and that kind of tells the story in itself. Whereas if you go 20 years down the line with um, Judge Dredd, I think you're going to get a little bit more embedded in the backstory. So for us, it was quite easy to take it on the basis of an early story or two. Okay, so this is an incredible world. These are the best stories to tell to get people invested in that world. Yeah, I hope you're not hearing my TARDIS taken off in the background. (laughs) (laughs) It's on my shelf. I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah, Um, Uh, you better. Yeah, so we uh, we we chose those two stories. We we ended up into um, um, uh, I think it was um, forty episodes each. So we did eighty three minutes in the end, Mm. Uh, and they went out once a day, uh, Monday to Friday. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah, that's and then really they were great. compiled as CDs and cassettes. Brilliantly, they were released really <laughs> double cassettes. <laughs> so, uh, so I haven't got that, but I do have, I do have the CDs, the and I do have my original copies of the books. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, so somebody has those out. cassettes out there. I'm sure they do. <laughs> I bet they can't play them on anything. Yeah. <laughs> You have to eBay the actual cassette player, yeah. not the... Um, the other thing I should mention as well, of course, is that we uh, we were doing these adaptations at the same time as the Stallone movie was coming out. So this was the uh, summer 95. Uh, so that yeah, was another yeah. consideration to factor in because we were going to be aware that people would be coming to dread at that time through the movie. So again, we wanted to try and make sure that the, the two kind of combined. Mm. Um, and in fact, they did take elements of Judge Caligula into the story, but they made it much okay. more about Rico, if you know the film about the uh, the evil twin. Um, uh-huh. So, yeah, so that was the other thing to factor in is that that was happening at the same time. Okay, that's a lot to kind of take on in a project, but also kind of helpful to have those constraints to sort of uh, for- force you to be creative uh, about uh, what you choose and how and where you place things. It's funny because um, listening to, to the, the, yeah, the adaptations that Nat's produced is that I'm so jealous of the fact that Nat could just enjoy some of the moments you yeah. know, expand and be in the moment, whereas our thing was always just relentlessly push, push, push. You've got three mm. minutes, you've got a three minutes, you've got to push this story on. Yeah. So everything was crammed, you know, to try and get it going. So, um, I mean, this is it, you know, this is a big book. 
you know, when yeah, you look yeah. through yeah. it, the yeah. fact that we had to get it get it done in three minute installments was was a heck of a job. <laughs> Whereas I had yeah. 15 minutes to do four pages, which was very nice. <laughs> yeah, Matt, look at you living the life. I mean, well, with all of that uh, free reign, uh, why did you choose what you chose to uh, put out? Um, because they made me laugh on the whole, or because I thought they had a good twist that we could do well. Uh, um, yes, the selection procedure was just... Is, well, no, that's, sorry, sorry, that's, that's a little bit, I'm being a bit disingenuous. There was a, cer a certain amount of selecting um, from creators who've gone on to greater things. We wanted, we knew we wanted to have some Alan yeah. Moores in there, some Grant Morrison's in there. Um, uh, but generally it was, uh, and, and you know, we had a lot of help from Rebellion and saying, oh, here's this good new one, which got us uh, uh, ones we wouldn't have seen otherwise. So having a mix of classic and new, but generally, mm. will it be funny was the question. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that, that drives any kind of comedic performer. So I get that very internally. Um, uh, Chris, uh, the big why question, uh, why have you done this? <laughs> why have you chosen what you chose? Why, Chris, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> Just taking questions from the forums now. Why? <laughs> I think for us, I've sort of touched on it briefly already, but it's it was to do with the topics that, are being uh, explored and uh i guess a lot of the time yeah it, they sort of feel like visionary uh, uh sort of comics so we did the dread essential america co collection which is all about democracy and we had populist politics going on we had yeah. as i mentioned earlier the storming of the capital all of that just felt really relevant the other thing is that story feels like quite a nice in as well it's relative it's all about politics but it's also peppered in with some action you sort of get a sense of uh, dreads philosophy basically yeah. which was sort of quite a nice way in uh, we did the pit which is a lot about you know corruption uh police corruption police brutality all of that feels <laughs> unfortunately yes. incredibly relevant uh halo jones has a sort of feminist angle but also uh, the existential angst which is sort of fairly fairly present at the moment um so i yeah i mean i just they just felt uh like stories that would be true and resonate with an audience nowadays and yeah you know, yeah i mean i think that, that that was the main thinking is like are they relevant basically yeah yeah what do we need to hear right now Cut. Um, I come in on what Chris was saying geez, as well, because um, yeah. like I said, I, I went back today and started just listening back, shocked to find that in uh, The Day of the Lord Died, one of the first things he does is build a wall. He builds the wall. <laughs> we and have no he, new ideas. Yeah. He's go, my <laughs> build God, a wall. You know, there we are. It's, um, you know, it's, it's Trump, it's Putin, it's all of these people all rolled yeah. into one, all with the madness yeah. of Caligula. But yeah, yeah, quite a shock, actually, to, to hear that and see that. Yeah. Mm. No, I mean, I don't, don't think we're too far off from uh, Caligula <laughs> again <laughs> uh, anymore. I feel, it feels like it's coming down the pike. Um, so I, this is open to anyone. Uh, how would you categorize the difference between an audio book and an audio drama? I don't know, Chris, what was the, what would, presumably there is a difference that you it's a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, mm. I mean, I, actually, interestingly, speaking to, to you guys as well, we're talking um, about uh, length limitations. That was one thing we did, didn't have with the adaptations. Mm. We didn't make them as long as we needed them to be. Um, but uh, I know, again, I suppose it's all to do with a narrative voice. I think that does help to classify something more as a, a, an audio book than a drama. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that that's the main thing is that it's it's the extent to which you're uh, hand holding the listener through all these different scenes. Mm. I suppose that, that but it, I mean, the point is, there's no I don't need to say this. There's no obvious answer to that question. It's quite difficult mm. to answer, I suspect. And, and I'm sure a lot of everyone has a different opinion. Yeah. But certainly that's yeah. one element I feel helps. But your yeah. feeling is that someone sort of guiding the audio the audience feels more like an audio book than an audio drama where you're just, just sort that. of and dropped it's into the, just the narrative voice as well. Just the fact that the in a lot of the cases, I in fact I can think of all there's all there's always something behind those uh, comments. There's always a personality behind it and sort of drawing yeah. that out mm. that lends itself to audio book rather than drama. Perhaps mm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to say something? I think that's right. I think I we certainly felt um free to move away um 
we the our authorial viewpoint could be whatever the most interesting way of telling that bit of the story was and it wasn't necessarily tied to what the writer had writer's voice was i suppose which is um maybe that's a distinction in that we we could start from a scene that isn't in the thing if we had to if it was the best way of telling the story we are guided it was um yes how do we tell the story most effectively which sometimes will be very close to the way it was set out and sometimes um doesn't have to be in what we were doing mm. yeah. i think the um, the thing for us is that we had no narrator so we had to rely purely on news flashes or conversation or whatever to mm. communicate certain bits of exposition yeah um but certainly one thing that Dirk was very keen on is is giving the whole thing music, sound effects, mm. uh, cast. Again, a huge big thing was just the fact that it was mixed in amazing stereo, mm. which was quite a revolutionary thing in 95. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. you know, at, at, so at that point, you know, what, as I said earlier, what, Jed, uh, what Judge Jed was trying to do was be a, a movie soundtrack, but without the pictures. So mm. I think there was a very big, at the point, very different, Sort of style between an audio book and a drama, and this was very much towards the drama. Yeah, yeah. I think it helped uh, if people knew the original material. By the way, I think it must be said. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. You know, we tried to avoid any kind of uh, you know uh, narrative, you know, narrator, narrator yeah. voice. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is something I'm particularly curious about because. Um, you know, if you are uh, directing or producing something in general, uh, typically it's the writer who has determined uh, how things should be cast, maybe the director, but with something like this, uh, audience has a little bit more of a say because they quite have uh, quite a bit of ownership over the material. How do you decide who to cast or how do you cast something when you know it, it's like these are these are characters that people have held in their imaginations for quite some time how do you go about that process um i we were quite lucky in that uh because lockdown had just started um there were a lot of very <laughs> good performers <laughs> yeah, with a lot of time on their hands and so we could phone up Al Murray or we could phone up you and say please can you do it and you'd say yes um yeah. and <laughs> can um, I do anything sure yes. <laughs> so we're uh, in one way yes we have so it, the practicalities were slightly different because when I when we first talked to Rebellion about it of course we planned doing it in a studio and doing it probably as I imagine the way you did Paul um uh, but we were forced into a, very quickly into a different way of working. Um, Everyone under their duvets and a microphone <laughs> they just bought off of Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> and we were sending <laughs> microphones around. In fact, we had um, a long, a long discussion with Charlie Brooker uh, because Connie Huck was working on it. As he, we were trying to teach him how to plug in the USB microphone to the last, to the right bit of the computer. Yeah. Uh, so we were currying microphones around. It was all, yeah, it was huge fun. But it did mean that we <laughs> could go for. Um, I'm not sure we. I paid much attention to what I thought the audience thought people sounded like. I think my concern was mainly who's the best, funniest performer for this okay. bit. And because yeah. they're probably available because it's the middle of a pandemic. Yes. Can we yes. Get them? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Now, for uh, those of you who did not have the benefit of producing during a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, I'm interested to hear from you, uh, Chris, when you've uh, cast things, how you go about that process. Is it, do you feel any extra weight on you in that or not really, you're going to do what you do? Yeah, no, there's a lot of pressure. There always is. I mean, I, I will say that uh, I, I I directed them and, and did sound design on them. I didn't do the casting, so I can't take the blame for, for, for anything. But, <laughs> but no, what I can say, no, I mean, I think we we, we obviously had to go with voice. We, we wanted to have a diverse cast. That's the first mm -hmm. thing. And uh, we wanted to perhaps have some slightly unexpected voices in there as well. One 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 of the most pleasing pieces of casting I had was Kima mm -hmm. Bob as Rodis mm -hmm. in um, in uh, Halo Jones. Did a fantastic job. She was amazing and brought out a whole new quality to that character that I mm -hmm. never imagined until she stepped into the studio and I thought oh hang on yeah this is we're going to roll with this um but no I mean I suppose it's really tricky there's always a lot of pressure because the people listening to these love the characters and yeah. have a very clear idea and you know it would, we, we had a lot of discussions about the Joseph Fiennes uh as as Dredd 
uh, I guess the, the the thinking there was, well, we're going to do America, where which is quite a sort of cerebral as a, a or dread in that particular one is very political yeah. and very crude. And so we sort of leaned a bit more towards the Clint Eastwood than perhaps the Carl Urban, I suppose, in terms of the delivery. That was the choice, I suppose. But now, I mean, it's 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 very difficult. But I suppose you know, if we if we want to bring the audiences to it, if we want to uh, uh, also, as I say, have a, a you know a diverse cast and people who, who perhaps you wouldn't have thought initially, um, yeah. you know. And, and as I say, I mean, I, I have there a lot of of people we cast. I was really pleasantly surprised brought something completely new that I you know that works I mean that's not to say that they're complete choices that don't work they you know they engaged with the comics beforehand and made those character choices yeah and, and you know they're, they're really neat interpretations of those characters uh Paul anything to add from so uh, a very different experience from the from Chris and Nat but we were um uh, we were working with with Dirk's rep company, so they'd already done the previous adaptations, oh, okay. and, and in fact, various other shows. So, uh, so we had Michael Roberts on board, great comedian who'd actually done the uh, the Marx Brothers adaptations for radio. So um, we had a cast of five uh, for all four hours. Um, to, I mean, literally dozens yeah, of characters, and, and yeah. frequently, you know, an actor would be talking to themselves as two different. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that great split personality thing. So, um, yeah, we had we had four men and one woman doing the whole thing, uh, and they were brilliant. And versatility yeah. was crucial. I mean, they were voice artists, mm. yeah. uh, incredible voice artists. I mean, Gary Martin as Dread was phenomenal just because he had to add this gravelly voice, which absolutely destroyed him. So yeah, by the end of the yeah. day, he was hoarse and just worn out. But also, again, Gary was doubling up. Gary was playing other characters. Yeah. So um, versatility and, and the ability to adapt was so crucial for our cast. Um, and again, listening back again, five people, it's extraordinary mm, to think the whole the mega city has been played by five people. <laughs> that is but incredible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, such a wide range of experience from being able to get all of this diverse talent or being able to get almost anyone because of life circumstances to like having five workhorses who just had to do everything and figure out yet another voice that they could make their bodies uh, create. I and so, remember the ones they were doing before, of course, yeah. it's a terrible thing. Did you <laughs> have that person Riley, in the background go, Riley again. <laughs> did, was there someone going, oh, actually, I think that sounds too much like that person, or did <laughs> they just have to, like, keep it all straight? Yeah, I mean, this is occasionally they have to just literally rewind the tape. I mean, we were on tape, yeah. no digital, mm -hmm. literally we had to rewind the tape to hear back a voice, to just yeah, remind nice, themselves yeah. which, which accent they used. Again, we were playing with lots of American accents, so uh -huh. um, it was trying to remember which one you were using for where. <laughs> good fun though good um i i mean i'm i'm just amazed to hear that people had lots of american accents uh <laughs> usually there's like one or two uh, <laughs> and it either sounds like a valley girl like super new york <laughs> no, no one there talks like that actually uh <laughs> so so um from your various perspectives on the productions that you have been a part of what would you individually say was the most difficult part of your production process? And what was the most rewarding part of your production process? Like what was the high, what was the, maybe not the low, but like the most grueling part of, of uh, making it uh, what it needed to be? Uh, for us, I would say the most difficult part was simply the practicalities because it was happening during lockdown. It was, I've got to get a microphone courier to this person. I've got to make sure they can plug it in. I've got to talk them through the audio set. I've got to talk them through the recording system we're using. And then we do it and we realise that someone hasn't pressed record somewhere or there's <laughs> uh, yes. one, one actor insisted on talking into the wrong side of his microphone for a long time. It took us a long time to diagnose that <laughs> because oh, yeah. everything seemed to be working. Of course. It sounded horrible. Of course. Um, so that was, which means, you know, it, things took longer than they... Um, probably needed to but again some of the most rewarding stuff was the same listening to these people often in corners of their bedrooms um surrounded by their duvets uh bringing yes. new worlds to life uh with new work by new writers um you know paying homage to old stories was just that was that was pretty magical that was pretty wonderful um yeah, yeah so both 
So new technology brings like a whole host of new yeah. problems, but also, yeah, some beautiful things. But it meant we could do it, which we couldn't have done yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Chris, what about uh, you, sort of highs and lows of your production process? So, I mean, we we were sort of also mid-pandemic, so we did have some some of those challenges, not consistently across, but the, occasionally it was always this thing of like, you know, trying to make sure that, your co- the, the, the problem is that the actors need to bounce off each other really yeah. ideally and and it's very very difficult to manufacture that and to fix it in post so mm-hmm. as much as possible we always try to get people in at the same time so that mm-hmm. that was always an issue um trying to just the logistics of that um i mean i suppose that the 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 big challenge after that is obviously in in post to make it all work and the pacing work right occasionally that can be quite grueling and you've just got to go with you know your gut instincts and and what works earlier on in pre-production I, I, we were very torn constantly about what to change what to what what to to adapt and what to leave in because we were again very guided by this principle no it has to be faithful um so that was always you know a, a t- tough decisions to make um yeah. in terms of the rewarding aspect i think probably yeah, the yeah. most the part that i always enjoy the most is when you get to put music into the mix because we've okay. um I, I I tend to the way we tend to work is we cut cut all the speech together, drop in some effects, uh, uh, do all the sound design around it, and then I'll send the, our in-house composer a brief saying, "Okay, this is what I need in this scene." A few adjectives <laughs> <laughs> bounces off that, um, and then what tends to happen if the new, if the composer is good is that suddenly there's this sort of glue that appears and everything comes together in a way that's yeah, I mean, as someone, you know, I am a musician, but I don't compose. It, there's something quite mystical about that. And then to sort of then be able to the mix it all underneath and just, yeah. you know, put the finishing touches. But there's an, a, a real side to that, I suppose, because music is nonverbal. That's to me quite non intangible. And you just think, wow, the magic is happening at this particular mm. moment, basically. Yeah, it's I mean, everything you're saying sounds kind of like that first sort of tech rehearsal that you have in theater, because that's my background and everyone's been doing things in their silos. And it's, you know, it's not only, you know, the director keeps telling you that it's working and it's going to be a show and you definitely don't believe them because you're like barely hanging on. And then suddenly the, you know, the music comes in or the scene elements come in, you know, the lighting comes in and like everyone involved goes, Oh my God, like this is, this is real. This is really happening. It's a thing. Everything suddenly makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's got to be such an incredible feeling when you've worked so hard to kind of pull it all together. And I mean, Paul, you had a sort of radically different experience with what was going on in the world at the time and technology. And obviously, five people doing everything. But, you know, you may have spoken to some of that. But, you know, what were the really difficult parts of your process? And what was sort of just the most rewarding part of it? You know, obviously, you had weeks of it going out as well, and potentially feedback from the outside world on it, too, as it was going. I think the the first thing to say is, yeah, we we were all in a room together, which was fabulous, albeit a very small recording booth. You know, it was really cramped in there um, because not only did we have our cast in there, but also we had we had foley, we had foley artists <laughs> shaking chains and and banging things, and you know all that classic old school radio. Yeah. You know, we were doing so as well as the five actors. There'd be a couple more people in there. You know shaking things moving things around so it was it was but what i love about that is it was a real little gang mentality it was a real nice team yeah. so we were all hanging out together for days on end in this small studio um but i loved that i love the fact that we all became quite close and quite tight together so that was a lovely thing i really enjoyed that and i mean even wilf who was doing one of our engineers was doing the music so everyone was kind of dubbing up and hands on so i enjoyed that a lot the downside i think was the fact that Again, classic. We just didn't have enough money. The whole thing <laughs> rushed through. You know, it's BBC Radio budgets. You know, and I think yeah. there was a slight thing. I can probably say it now that Radio One didn't seem that keen particularly. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh god, we had you there, but they didn't really want you. Anyway. <laughs> you know, but uh, so uh, what was infuriating us <laughs> to find out that they were sponsoring the premiere of Judge Red, and they hadn't invited anyone on the uh, the production. <sighs> So there we were oh. being broadcast every day. And we oh. had to go, sorry, could, 
can we come along? Can we come? Can we come along? Uh, yeah. So there was a slight feeling, I think, of, you know, I mean, we were very proud of what we were doing, but perhaps slightly undervalued. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, that still hurts 30 years later. Like, for sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, come on. Like, we did make the whole thing and we worked real damn hard on doing it as well. Yeah. Uh, but I do love that you actually did get to have that sort of, I, for lack of a better way of putting it for me, that theater experience of like congealing as a unit and really, you know, everybody's like pulling together to make this happen. Um, bouncing ideas of each other, of course, was one of the yeah. great things about the show. Is everyone saying, oh. try this, how about this? How can we do this? You know, everyone be chipping yeah. ideas, which is so much easier when you're in a room together. Yeah. Uh, anyone can be a little bit more frank and a bit more blunt. I think yeah. that helped. But I mean, the quality of things can grow exponentially when people are kind of, you know, uh, ratcheting things up with each other, I think. Um, and uh, sort of as, as we're starting to draw these things to a close, I'm I'm curious of what you think about uh, now. Uh, I mean, would you all say that the world of uh, 2022 AD feels much like the future that you imagined when you were reading 2000 <laughs> AD? Uh, how do you feel like it overlaps not at all or uh, way too much? <laughs> I must just say, I mean, again, just shocking just how much this feels like now. Uh, not yeah. I don't want to get too far into what's happening in the world, but uh, I, it was just striking. We're dealing with mad dictators, violence, um, dehumanisation. Uh, we're dealing with immigrants. We're dealing yeah. with, um, yeah. you know, the, the people who are shunned. It just felt so horribly now, yeah. despite reading something that is now 44 years old, 43 years old. Yeah. Terrifying. Well, I mean, did you, like, I'm curious, you picked up the very first, you know, uh, edition, like you've been with this from the beginning. Mm. Uh, do you feel like at the time, uh, you know, I can only imagine if I read this at the time, I'd be like, well, okay, that's really interesting. In science fiction, <laughs> there's no way that's going to happen. Like, did you ever get a sense of, of this being more prescient or is it just hindsight that has proven that? Like at the time, did you think like, oh, one day some people will live to see a future like this or no way? Well, it's strange. So, I mean, okay, I'm 52. So when the first comic came out, I was eight. And at that kind of, of course, we were full of Star Wars. We were full of Star Trek. We were full of great high budget science fiction. And I think we all just felt like, you know, the future's going to be great. It's going to be hover cars <laughs> and it's going to be teleporters. And actually, the interesting thing about 2000 ideas is it did come through with this dystopian idea um, mm. and actually very much work against what was the Hollywood theme of things get better and hope yeah. prevails. And actually, yeah. you know, Dredd is such an anti hero. He's a kind of fascist, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I, I was quite shocked, I think, and I continue to be shocked, actually. And I go back and think, this was a kid's comic in 1978. These characters were kid's characters. Extraordinary, really. But, yeah, I think, um, I, I, I mean, I must say, I wish I'd kept that first comic. In fact, I'm sure I should find it online if I'm allowed to do that. Mm. Um, <laughs> and have another book, you know, copyright issues, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, I think that the one thing that 2000 has always done is always challenge perhaps the Hollywood view of things and be yeah. a little bit more sophisticated and just be a little bit more subtle. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Except for my yeah. sledgehammer comedy writing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, you know, if you've got something that is, is, is coming from uh, emerging writers uh, from every different walk of life, you're going to have an antithesis to Hollywood naturally from people's points of view and just sort of picking up on the pulse of where society is right now. Um, and yeah, I can, uh, as you're saying, you know, growing up, all the science fiction was things are going to be great. And like, I love Star Trek and it is all <laughs> like things are going to get better. Um, and it is important to have something like this that's going, but what if they don't? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, same question uh, for you, Chris or Nat. I mean, do you, how do you feel like the world now compares mm. to what you grew up reading or uh, even just sort of were introduced to, I guess, maybe more recently for the two of you, but still. I, I think as well, because 2000 AD was um, only part of my comics education as a child. I also read to, uh, I was a great fan of Scream, which uh, is again now in Rebellion, which was, uh, a horror comic, which didn't yeah. last very long. Uh, and that also feels strangely appropriate to where we are today. Uh, and Oink, which was <laughs> political, well, it wasn't all political satire, but it was essentially bum jokes and uh, <laughs> drawings of Mrs. Thatcher and Mary Whitehouse uh, throwing poo at each other. Um, 
<laughs> and that feels like we've needed that more than ever today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bring yeah, back Oink. Didn't come soon enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything to add to that, Chris? I mean, not a huge amount, except that, I mean, I suppose that uh, perhaps what, what, what the, the uh, writers were responding to at that time was to what was happening at that time as well. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. unfortunate truth, as when we sort of come full circle with what we were saying at the beginning <laughs> about science fiction, that things don't change as much as we like to think they do, no. perhaps. No. Um, so it's that, really. It's, it's an awful note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> In another 45 years, there'll be people who've done other audio adaptations having the same yeah. conversation. Yeah, some conversations about it. It's strange how little has changed. Well, yeah. how about this? This may be a little bit more positive uh, note to end on. Are there um, characters or stories from the world of uh, 2000 AD that you think are crying out for adaptations to the audio format that you haven't mm. done that you're still like, oh, this needs to happen? That maybe gives us a little bit of hope for what can happen in the future, at least creatively. Hmm. Are there things that haven't uh, yes. been I think there are. I think yeah. touched okay. yet that you feel yeah. like it's time? Yes, I think uh, Nemesis the Warlock, because the uh, visuals in that would make any non-animated version so difficult to do. Mm. Um, and even then, when you do that animation, you're going to risk you know, alienating a lot of the fans if you don't do it absolutely Perfectly, I think uh, Nemesis the Warlock is uh, probably the most obvious candidate for an audio adaptation. I'd also, I, I'd like to do the 13th Floor, which wasn't 2000 that was in Scream, but it's also owned by Rebellion. Uh, but the 13th Floor was about a uh, computer that controlled an office block, and if it didn't like you, it used to take to the non-existent 13th Floor and put you in a computer-generated hell for the rest of your existence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more of an instruction manual than yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the future is going to be. Um, Chris, are there any things, uh, any stories or characters that you would like to see be adapted in the future? I'm having to be so, so careful. <laughs> of course, of course. I'm sorry. I know. Or you're like, I've signed so many things. <laughs> No, it's very difficult. I, I I have to say, I do agree with Nat on Nemesis. I think Nemesis, because of the world uh, and those illustrations, lends itself very, very well to audio. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree. That was my the answer at the back of my head when you were going to ask me, unfortunately. Yeah. So I'm just agreeing with Nat on that one. Well, that's a groundswell around that mm. particular story. Uh, Paul, uh, maybe you don't have as much to lose by speaking your mind as <laughs> you would like to see <laughs> be adapted, but maybe it's the same answer. I, I, am, not, too. I am not such a, a comic, uh, well, what's the word here? Impresario, is <laughs> too, shall we say. But I, what I would like to do is just go back and fill in those gaps that I couldn't do back in 95. So, you know, I want to do more Dread. I want to do The Cursed mm. Earth because we've Amazing. mapped out quite a bit of it. You know, we've mapped out how do we do this, how do we work? So, you know, really? I'd like to go back and do that. Mm. I mean, is it, is it that it didn't happen because the money and sort of resources and time weren't there or the technology wasn't there to... Oh, it was, well, we, had, we, we came down to two stories and we had a shortlist, really, of three. So the Cursed Earth was the one that didn't make it. But, okay. you know, All right. that's, that's unfinished business. The one like, that, that got that away. Go, Come on, let's get that. Let's get the gang back together. Let's okay. get the, yeah. back from Hollywood and Sandman and Neil Gaiman. Yes. And, uh, yes. Get him back in the sound house. Yeah. Yes. Square, with that's... a man carrying chains behind him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even old school. Who needs digital recording? No, no, no. Get them chains. Yeah. Uh, I, I, um, I, it's just very exciting to hear that uh, there's promise for more of this to uh, come to light in the future, just because there are people out there like me who are, uh, I don't know, like Benjamin buttoning their way into comic, the comic universe. And like, I, you know, at middle age being like, this is a really rich universe and these are ways like pathways for us to get into it and so you know uh thank you for inspiring future generations to do this or as well as you know inspiring yourself to continue to do this work um and thank you so much for uh joining us in conversation today um i want to thank all of our contributors uh nat tapley uh, Chris Thompson and Paul Powell. Uh, we're going to draw things to a close there. My name is Desiree Birch, and thank you all so much for joining us today to celebrate 45 years of 2000 AD.